Tyler Wall, welcome to the Smart Nutrition Made Simple Show. How you doing, brother? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you so much for having me today. Dude, it's it's an absolute privilege and honor to uh, catch up again. We were just hanging out in Arizona, pumping some iron. Um, yep. You were visiting with some buddies. How was that trip, by the way? It was wonderful. It was refreshing. It was rejuvenating, not just from getting away from uh, the gray skies of New York to sunny yeah. Arizona, but seeing my friends and meeting you too. That was really wonderful that we had a yeah, chance to that pump on and hang. Yeah, dude, it's so much fun. It's funny how, you know, as we get older, at least I've observed this, is as we get older, just kind of the types of things that we like to do and the type of people that we surround ourselves with and the things that we do with those people, um, really how much they change. Like I love, you know, meeting new people, going and getting a workout with them. Uh, it's just like, and then having those conversations while you're training, as opposed yes. to like sitting in a bar, just, you know, getting right. drunk or something like that. Agreed. It, we're, you know, that's, that's an environment that we're both in our element. Yeah. It's, it's, it's primal. I would say it's primal for both of us, especially. And the fact that we get to share that space, share that energy and have conversations like in between sets is super powerful. Yeah. It's really fun. I find myself really growing the most. And, and so that's, you know, for me, and, and I know you're just addicted to kind of continuing education and, and having mentors. And I want to talk about that in this, in this conversation. But for me, it's when I really kind of learn the most isn't even necessarily from those seminars per se, or, but, but really being in the environment, being surrounded by like-minded people and That's just, true. just kind of feeding osmotically from them through those conversations, it's like just understanding, like, what are you doing? That's working well, you know, what are you not doing? How can we synergize so on and so forth? Yeah, I agree. I, I really love that use of, uh, osmo osmotically that you just mentioned. That's yeah. a, a word I, I frequently use as well. So that really nice. resonates. Um, so you, uh, you were telling me how you are, you, you're, uh, just hit your one year anniversary living in New York city. Yeah. Um, tell me about like what that looks like. What, what do you do in New York city? Um, yeah. how have you shaped your environment? Yeah. I love that. Thank you. So I moved, uh, after eight years of living in Seattle, long story short, I had plans to move to California after a, and after the end of a long-term relationship, then COVID happened a couple of weeks into that plan. So things kind of got a wrench thrown in the gears. And as I was wandering the country a little bit during that summer, I came to New York and I felt a calling. And it's weird because I'm from Connecticut and I came to New York like my whole childhood, young adulthood, it came back and forth. It was just easy train ride into the city. And never during that time was I like, yeah, I want to live in New York. However, uh, and, and I was always like, oh, it stinks. It's dirty. Like, it's just not for me. I had plenty of friends that lived here, loved it. I never felt a calling. Well, during the summer of 2020, I was going through this major transition in my life and being in New York city and feeling the, sh the energy shift had a profound effect on me. And I knew that a lot of the old blood and a lot of the, basically a lot of the residents had moved away bought mm. houses in the countryside or moved to other states or so on and so forth because people could work remote. Mm -hmm. And I had this, this strong feeling that there was going to be a lot of a new blood moving in after things settled back down, maybe in the springtime. And there'd be this major shift in culture and this, uh, you know, this, this revolution in, in art and in, in energy. And I said, you know what, I want to check this out. I think, I think this is something I want to explore. So I made that plan. I said, I'm going to get through the, my final winter in Seattle and in the spring I'll move to New York. So as I've come into deeper into adulthood, I've really recognized the power of environment. And I was recognizing when I was in Seattle that that environment was no longer serving me. Mm -hmm. I had some great friends there. The access to nature was beautiful, but the general energy of the city and the general attitude of the people there just didn't really coincide with who I was continually becoming. And ha after spending some time in New York, uh, summer of 2020, I really, and even though the city was like totally dead, nothing was open. Mm -hmm. It still had that vibe to it. It still had that, that frequency of you can be who you want to be here and you can be in your full expression. And everybody's here to like, there's, there's no, there's no real ostracization or anything like that. It's like, it's full acceptance of, this big melting pot of people from not only mm -hmm. all over the world, but from all different backgrounds and all different ethnicities and all different, all different attitudes and orientations. So 
I, I thought, hey, like, as I'm, again, going through this major transition in my life, I'd like to place myself in this and see who I become in the process. That's awesome, man. Uh, good for you. What do you think it's been over your over your career that's helped you start to identify with uh, and or sort of embrace changing as a person um, and really searching out that type of environment? You know, I, I'd say the catalyst was I was 20, I think I was 26, I was 2013. And I was living in Connecticut. I had a good job. I had a great apartment. What great was your job? Uh, I, I worked for uh, a sales for this utility company. And it was just okay. like, it was the easiest sales job ever. Yeah. It was pretty much like the, the government funded the, the electrical company to pay for the programs. I was Got it. it was like a no brainer, basically. Got it. So while I was making good money, again, my life was super comfortable. My apartment was great. My friend group was great. I had this like unnerving feeling that I knew exactly where my life was going. If I stayed on this path, mm. it was a life of comfort. It was reliable, but I knew I like, I could see the years unfolding ahead of me and it's not what I wanted. I wanted more adventure. I wanted to step into the unknown a little bit more. So it was that same year I had visited my sister in Seattle and just on vacation. I had no plans to move there. But during that week, I said, you know what, what would happen if I, step outside my comfort zone. I steer off that path and I move to a, di a totally different city that I'm very unfamiliar with. I have a small support group via my sister and her, her fiance, mm -hmm. but uh, like what will happen then? And I was like, you know what? I'm going to give it a shot. What's the worst thing I can, that happens is I can move back home and I can get back on that path. Right. So I would say that was the biggest catalyst for me. And then from there, it just continued to unravel. It's like, okay, I've lived this life of comfort for so long and I see what it's, it's done for me. I see how it's helped shape me into who I am. And while there's been like many great insights and discoveries during that time, it's also very limiting because it's safe, because it's familiar. So that first step moving to Seattle, I would say really opened things up for me as far as leaning into, leaning into the unexpected and leaning into the unknown. And then from there, I got more interested uh, we, we talked about our, our past histories, you and I both in like strength conditioning, mm -hmm. and sports rehab and things like that. Um, so that basically that trajectory kind of coincided with like, okay, how can I step out of my comfort zone? Like what else can I explore here? And how can I put my, how can I put myself on the line to test myself and discover other parts of myself? Um, and then it just kept unraveling from there. And then as I transitioned from more fitness based coaching into more of like the psychology behind coaching that that helped me understand people better, but also understand myself better. Mm -hmm. And it continues to do so. So it's interesting, you know, I think being in fitness and, and health is, is sort of figuratively and, and, and literally um, forcing you to embrace discomfort, you know, day in and day out just by virtue. I mean, if even if we're just, you know, analogously talking about strength training is like yeah. literally you're making your, you're pushing yourself into discomfort every single session to some degree. And yes. I think it, it, it is such a potent metaphor for life, but also for experiencing, you know, how profound things can be when we give ourselves the opportunity to grow. And, and so that was your impetus into, you know, health and fitness and nutrition, maybe you could just share with us briefly kind of about that journey and then how that led you into, because we met towards the end of your, we'll, we'll call it like your nutrition coaching career, yeah. if you will. And, and then how you um, transitioned into where you are now, which I don't know if you want to call it more life coaching, or you can tell us kind of how yeah. you want to um, embrace it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I really, really enjoy what you just said, though, as far as the, the metaphor between strength training and development in areas outside of that. That was freaking beautiful. And mm -hmm. it's so true. Once, I mean, for anybody, whether it's endurance training or strength training or any kind of fitness related endeavors, if you have a goal, if you know what direction you're moving towards, you get to discover new parts of yourself every day. Every time you step into your training or your workouts, you get to reveal who you are. 
even if you, sometimes you're feeling crappy or sometimes you're not feeling into it, you still get to reveal who you are in that process. It's a really beautiful thing. Mm. And, it, and it has a massive carryover to the rest of your life. I'm just nodding my head because, you know, not to go too far down the rabbit hole and, and totally bro out on this stuff, but it's, it's just, you know, I've been having this conversation more frequently with clients is like really trying to embrace the strength training process on so many different levels, but of most importance is, is when we've been doing this for an extended period of time is, is just the, the such a strong translation. It's like when you are in fatigue, when you are at the end of a set, it's like those last couple reps, you know, where it's all the mental game of telling yourself, what is it that you're actually committing to? How much do you really want it? Yes. You know, how much are you willing to push for it? And and that in and of itself is is you know is exactly what we need to be doing with so many other aspects of our lives, in my opinion. Agreed. So, anyways, Agreed. proceed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I started college studying strength and conditioning, and then I transferred my sophomore year to UConn. At that point, I had some idea in my head that I wanted to join the FBI. That I've, for some reason, I felt a calling at that moment in time after talking with some uh, friends who had siblings in the FBI. And I was like, oh, yeah, that sounds really interesting to me. Fast forward to my senior year, I decided I don't want to be in the FBI. They will own my life. I will not have any adventure. They will own my time. They will own my decisions. Were you still in strength and conditioning? No. So I, I transferred to poli sci and criminal justice. Okay. Okay. So when I was my, my senior year, I was like, I don't want to like, go back and like take all these tests or, you know, take all these classes rather uh, and sit in school for longer. So what can I do? My cousin's boyfriend at the time said, you can take your CSCS. If you have any bachelor's degree, right. you can study for it on your own and take that. And I was like, great, because that's kind of the gold standard for any kind of training, whether it's collegiate or professional yeah. teams or anything lower than that. So thankfully uh, that was an uh, opportunity. They still have it, I think until 2029, then they're changing it. 2027 maybe that they're they're changing it the, the the nsca is making it unavailable for people who have bachelor's degree to take the exam you have to have a, a focus on oh, that yeah. really that's interesting yes. um so i took that 2009 got my cscs started training individuals and groups and just by way i mean kind of going along with what we were just talking about is training had become such a an anchor in my life for the personal the physical benefits, the mental benefits, the emotional benefits. And I don't, I'm not a big fan of saying like, oh, the gym is my therapy. If you need therapy, go see a therapist. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The gym is therapeutic, but it is not an excuse to get out, get out of therapy. However, I digress. The gym was very therapeutic for me and I understood, and I was continuing to experience all the benefits from it in all facets of my life. So I felt the calling to, I want to share this with other people. I want to help people really empower themselves and discover what's inside them. And strength training is such a beautiful expression of that. So did that for a couple of years in Connecticut, moved to Seattle, did it for a few years there. And in 2015, I got recruited to be the rehab manager of a Seattle-based sports rehab clinic. And that was another catalyst in my life. That was another big turning point, which really led me to where I am today. And this is the reason why. So going from performance-based to more rehab based really helped me fine tune my communication with people, how I connect with them and really to better understand them. So a lot of the people go coming from the, the back or com coming into the clinic rather were overcoming injuries or having movement limitations. And you know what? A lot of that was mental as you know, right? Mm. So people generally correlate, Oh, I'm in pain. I must have some kind of soft tissue issue. Not always the case. A lot of it's because people are stressed out. They don't know how to manage their stressors and they don't really know how to manage their lives. So that really led me down some interesting rabbit holes as far as it relates to deeper senses of movement. But like I said, also the psychology behind things and how to communicate with people more effectively. Hmm. Because if I'm in the gym, obviously, I mean, communication is a huge part of my, my, my program design. But when you're in the, the sports rehab world or when you're in a clinic, it requires some more delicacy or, or, or it requires you to be more delicate rather mm -hmm. depending on the individual and a bit more of like a heart to heart connection in many cases. Sure. So that was like really, like I said, it really got me down all these rabbit holes of 
okay, like what is pain? What is this person going through? How can I have conversations with them to not be their therapist in the, in the rehab clinic, but to get them thinking differently and to help them understand that they do have a sense of control over their lives. Uh, and then that kind of like, yeah, like I said, that kind of led me down some interesting avenues. And it was also during that time, it was actually the year before I got recruited, I had hired Dr. Trevor Cashy, mm -hmm. of which uh, you and I met through. He is a uh, very intelligent. He's the most intelligent human being I've met as far as like, you know, book smarts and ability to translate a lot of those book smarts into common language. So for anybody listening, if you're not familiar with him, he's, uh, I, I don't know if he's still the youngest. He was the youngest PhD in biochemistry in our country. At one point, he, he got it at 21 years old, like got his undergrad at 15 or 16. And I had hired him off. I, f I read a totally random interview with him on, on this powerlifting site I used to read. Never heard of him in my life, but I really liked his approach to nutrition. At that point right. in time, I had a pretty good understanding of training. I knew how to write programs for myself, for other people, but the whole nutrition area was really gray and fuzzy. And it was really hard to decipher what's real and like what makes sense because there's all these fads all the right. time and there's all these you know, charlatans and gurus out there. So I was like, whatever, I'm going to hire this guy and see how it goes. Well, fast forward to 2018, I left my sports rehab job because I wasn't able to give the level of care that I wanted to give to the patients there. And as I was figuring out the next step for myself, uh, I actually went to go visit uh, Trevor in person for the first time after working with him for four years. I think we talked on the phone once during that time. Hmm. And he had offered me a position to uh, be a coach for him and his, his developing nutrition company. And I was like, amazing. You changed my life. Uh, in many, in many, many, many ways. And I would love to do this for other people. And he's like, you have a really good sense of how this works. Obviously there's some more things I can teach you, but I'd like to bring you on board. And that was another turning point for me is like, cool. Okay. Well, this is a different approach. Everything, you know, all these, all these different career paths I was in is st it's still looking at the same human being, but through different windows. Sure. Cool. I'm looking at this person from a performance base. I'm looking at this person going from like a zero to one, co coming from an injury, coming from nothing into actually moving their bodies. And then I'm coming from a nutrition standpoint um, to empower people. So when I worked for him, we used, we, we taught people to collect data on themselves, track their food, track their sleep, their energy, their steps, their training, just a number of different variables. So mm -hmm. they can make informed decisions based on that. So again, by, by way of Trevor being a scientist, he knows how to collect data and make decisions based on that data. So he created this beautiful program of which you can serve people by teaching them to empower themselves through data collection. Uh, and then that further got me down the path. He's, he's really big on psychology as well. And we've had right. many, many interesting, beautiful conversations over the, the course of our relationship. And <laughs> it was during that time, it's really interesting, like, um, I'm in one area and then there's something that happens outside of that, that leads me down a different path as well. Or like allows me to pull on a thread that's been revealed, but I hadn't really been uh, in tune with it. So while I was working for him, I, I'd seen a therapist for years in Seattle, had a great experience, really, really, really enjoy therapy and promote it for the majority of people. And I had a hunch that I wanted to explore hypnotherapy. So I Google searched hypnotherapy, Seattle. I found this, this guy, Jack Elias, and he was actually pretty close. He lived pretty close to me. So I went over his house for a session, which he has his office at, and like, it changed my life. It totally changed my life. Mm -hmm. I had such a profound experience sitting with him and his philosophy and of which like I'm a, a hypnotherapist now under, under him, under his tutelage, his philosophy is that the majority of people, like when I say hey, hypnosis, you probably have an idea in your mind about what you think that means. And a lot of people, not everybody, but a lot of people have these associations with like stage hypnotherapy mm -hmm. They're on stage, make you cluck like a chicken or do something silly. Right. That's kind of just the general public view of things. His philosophy is rather that we are all under hypnosis already, all of us all the time. And we're shifting from one trance of who we think we are to another of who we think we are. So when your wife says your name, you go under a trance of who you think you are to her. When your kids say your name, you go under a trance of who you think you are to them. 
when one of your clients says your name, same thing. Mm-hmm. We're shifting between all these trances and we live into them as if each one is true, but also none of them are true. So his, his philosophy is we're actually not necessarily hypnotizing you. We're de-hypnotizing you. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Because all these trances, all these levels of hypnosis that you find yourself under, they're limiting by nature. They're limiting by your beliefs of who you think you are to that person. Sure. Who you think you are to yourself. So the practice that he taught me and that I do with many people, depending if, if it's called for in, in, with, the, with the situation is we remove the veil, we remove those layers. So you actually have a deeper understanding of what's happening in reality and you have more choice. Mm-hmm. You know, when we talk about personal and professional growth, when we talk about stepping into discomfort, right? When we talk about um, just stepping out of your comfort zone, I can see how they align, right? To the degree that you feel like you are a certain person. And as you said, to certain people, and if we if we surround ourselves with certain people all of the time, we potentially um, limit our ability to step into who we could become. Right is essentially yes. what I'm hearing from you. That's that's correct, and that ties directly into what I was saying about Seattle before. Is like, right. hey, this city is really not serving me in a powerful way. Yet when I come to New York and I step outside and there's a skyscraper next door that allows me to really recognize, wow, a human being thought of this and human being created this. So environment, whether it's on a grand scale of whether where you decide to live or the people you surround yourself by or who you decide to follow on social media or what kind of books you read or what kind of news you watch, everything has such a profound effect on you. And people massively undervalue that. They really don't think about that because they get into these grooves of doing the same thing over and over Mm -hmm. yet everything and everyone is programming us at any given time. So if we are conscious of it, if we develop a certain level of awareness about, okay, who the heck do I want to be? Who am I right now? Who can I continually become? And what are the influences that are going to help me get and move there? What are the things that are preventing me from going in that direction? Then we can really reveal, okay, these are the changes that I could make to, to allow me to step into that version of myself. So yeah, like I said, like Seattle, I felt limited, come to New York, it's pure inspiration. And when I talk to anybody, I'm like, you know, I don't, I'm not a big fan of the term potential because potential is going to denote a limit. And I don't even like the term sky's the limit because that assumes there's a ceiling. Mm -hmm. It really comes down to who has the biggest imagination. Yeah. For anything in life, who has the biggest imagination? Because your imagination is the same thing that's constraining you. And it's the same thing that's freeing you. No, I mean, that's, that's the yeah. thing. I think we're just these, all these imposed confines mm-hmm. from, from the time we're, we're kids as to what we are capable of, what we should do, our parents telling us what we can't, should and shouldn't do, you know, yes. and, and that obviously in and of itself is extremely limiting. Yes. And that's, that's the big time when it happens is when we're children and the giants around us, whether it's our parents or teachers or or whoever's raising us, like you just said, tells us what we can or can't do, what we are or not are or are not capable of. And we take those things as truth because we don't have any evidence otherwise. Mm -hmm. So we're just these little exuberant balls of energy for a period of time. Imagination's running wild. We know no limits until the giants tell us otherwise. And those things imprint us. And then we carry that with us into our adulthood. And we still take those beliefs that were imprinted us, imprinted upon us as children as adults and we're really just taking a perceived memory of the past and projecting it onto the now and that's keeping us many of us stuck Mm -hmm. and and so i imagine that this is the main frame for your conversations with current clients around how to get themselves unstuck yes yes it's it's really interesting so part of what i do is coaching like that's a tool i have sometimes it's teaching sometimes it's mentoring sometimes it's consulting it really depends on the individual and what's necessary what's being called for in that moment or or for what's going on with them and while a lot of people have aspirations they have ideas in their head about where they want to go the path will reveal itself once we get the barriers out of the way 
that's the biggest thing stopping people from moving forward in, in a trajectory that they want to move. It's not that they don't have the, the skills or the tools or the resources necessary to move there. It's that there are things holding them back. Mm-hmm. And once we can reveal what those things are, then, then it's off to the races. And it's, oh, cool. Okay. Boom. You can, you can skyrocket in that direction. If, if for those, those listening, right, if, if we're imagining that we are not uh, living up to all of what we perceive to be our potential, right? We want more for our lives. And, you know, what I'm hearing is that first we need to identify uh, the barriers, right, that are keeping us from moving forward. What, how, how do we go about doing that? Is, is there a way where we could kind of hone in on what could be a c- couple potential things just kind of right off the bat to identify with? Yeah. Uh, there's, there's actually, this is kind of twofold. And this is one of the simplest, easiest, fastest ways to start to reveal these things, to start to unravel them. So again, we all have our beliefs, right? And our beliefs are based on our past experiences and what we've been told or indoctrinated with as children. And one of the things that can reveal some of these beliefs is putting a question mark at the end of any of your beliefs, something you say to yourself on a continual basis, even about who you think you are. So that's step one is just put a question mark at the end because curiosity, the practice of curiosity in any aspect of life is going to Mm -hmm. open up opportunity. It's going to allow you to look at things from a much more wide perspective than if it's a statement. If we say something, which many beliefs we say is fact, then we're looking at things from a very narrow view. If we had a question mark, it opens things up for us. We can see other possibilities. We can see other angles. Mm -hmm. So just adding a question mark, and I'm a big fan of journaling personally. It really helps us organize our thoughts and it really helps us process them in a deliberate way. It takes in other senses outside of just keeping things in our mind and allows us to uh, basically work things out better. So if, if you are a person that likes to journal and you're listening to this, highly encourage you to do so. Start to write out some of your beliefs and put question marks at the end. Some of them you're going to look at and you're going to be like, wow, that's really silly. I can't believe I've been saying that my whole adult life or my whole life. Can you give me an, give me an example? Yeah, let's see. So, um, I mean, simple one. I'm not smart enough. Sure. Big one people say to themselves, I'm not capable enough. I'm not fast mm-hmm. enough. You know, I'm, I'm not strong enough. Put a question mark. I'm not smart enough. Oh, huh. What, what, what does that mean about myself? And then the second thing after you add the question mark is what evidence do I have to believe that this is true? And oftentimes, mo- most of the time, people are going to be like, you know, I actually don't have ev- any evidence. Mm-hmm. I've had experiences that I might have taken as evidence, but they're not truth. And then it's like, whoa, I actually don't have to hang on to that anymore. I'll add one more part. I think those are probably the two most powerful. Add a question mark at the end of any of your beliefs and then ask yourself afterwards, what evidence do I have to believe that this is true? Mm-hmm. And then the third thing is, and th- this is helpful too, is what are the risks? What do I lose if I let go of this belief? And then <laughs> the, what are you going to lose? Nothing. And then we, we, when, when we realize that, then we can really understand, oh, there's actually nothing keeping this with us. There's nothing for us to cling on to about this anymore. And then you're free. I, I can see how the process of doing that every single day of perhaps journaling so that you can identify these self-limiting beliefs, challenge those, right? And then start to perpetuate the... Um, you know, the flow of what could potentially be right. based on you uh, overcoming those, uh, those, those said beliefs. Yes. That sounds pretty powerful. Yes. And then it opens up the space for like, what do I want to believe about myself? Right. Mm-hmm. What can I believe? What are the possibilities here? And then you get to explain with it. You get to experiment with that and you get to play with it and still, still come from that place of curiosity. Hey, I'm going to try this out. I want to believe this about myself. I'm going to go test it out. Okay. So looking back to your coaching career, looking back specifically to, well, strength training or one-on-one nutrition coaching. Now that you understand about the human psyche, what you do, 
it must be pretty profound to think about all of the self-limiting beliefs that were in fact self-limiting beliefs and not in fact calories and macros and yep you know n- nutrient you know vitamins and minerals and shit sure. like that absolutely right? i mean is that fair oh absolutely a thousand percent because i think that so many of our conversations especially like when we really start to get into the meat and potatoes no pun intended with a client is like <laughs> nice. you know like dude is this isn't even about nutrition anymore like you no. fucking hate your job yep. you're miserable at yep. home you keep hanging around with the same dipshits that you did 20 years ago yep and you just you know like you're just holding yourself back right you're perpetuating the same cycle over and over again yes and so it ends up being like listen yeah, I, the conversations can just going to keep coming to this. And I don't know how many clients I've had actually a, a good number of clients end up changing careers, yep. right? Because the conversation keeps coming up is like helping them understand, like, you do realize that the stress induced from you continuing to perpetuate these cycles is what's actually holding you back. Yes. Absolutely. And once they understand that, it's like, well, I don't have any choice if I want to grow and 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 become who I say I do. I have no choice but to change my actions, right? Change my environment. Yes, so it's unbelievable how all of this intertwines. People will exchange long-term, sometimes lifelong, chronic, low-level stress and anxiety. They, they will prefer. They will choose that over short-term, increased levels of discomfort. Right. Because they're used to it. It's familiar. It's safe. It's reliable. Oh, I'm going to stay with this job. It's reliable. I hate it. I hate it. And I hate who I am in it, but it's familiar. And I know what I'm going to get the next day. And at least I know the outcome, even if the outcomes, I know the outcome sucks. Yes. I'm still going to stick with that because the discomfort of change is so overwhelming to me. Right. It's fascinating. You know, the, the, Greatest predictor of what we're going to do tomorrow is what we're doing today. And it takes, it really takes, sometimes people wait for something major to happen, unfortunately, uh, you know, a tragic event or something really sharp to happen in their life to make a change. But it really takes a certain level of self-awareness and honesty to take a look at your own life and ask yourself, what changes do I need to make right now? And once you discover like, wow, you know, actually, I, maybe I do hate my job. Maybe I'm in this relationship that hasn't been serving me for months or even years or decades. It takes a certain level of discomfort. It, you really have to accept that, hey, I'm going to suffer for a little while in order to make these changes. And a lot of people just won't commit to that. It's too scary for them. And like you just said, the outcome is unknown. Regardless, guess what? Even though we might stick to this job and we, you know, we, we have an idea and the outcome is probably pretty reliable, it's still unknown. We can, there's nothing we can do to try to control reality. We can influence it in ways, but we can't control it. But we silly humans think that we can. We have no idea what's going to happen an hour from now or a year from now mm-hmm. or a decade from now. We have no idea. But we cling on to these concepts and these beliefs about, oh, if I keep doing what I'm doing right now, I'll get what I'm getting again and again. I'll be stable, I'll have yes. comfort. Yes. So that I can do X, Y, Z when the time comes. Right. Versus thinking about it as if the world were to end tomorrow, mm-hmm. what would I do? Right. What could I do? Yes. It's a very different way of thinking about things that I think would probably serve people pretty well. Absolutely. And you and I both know, and this, all of this is, <laughs> is just resorting right back to the initial conversation of embracing discomfort. And you and I both know by virtue of you continuing to evolve in your career is when you do the things that make you uncomfortable, you continue to grow to the degree that what you were doing a couple of years ago clearly isn't serving you anymore or perhaps motivating you or yes um, as fulfilling as what you're doing now and i can imagine you're going to continue to evolve in 
in your approach to coaching and helping people in whatever capacity that is, because I've no doubt that you're going to continue to serve people at the highest level, yeah. um, which I certainly can appreciate. <laughs> really, really good stuff. So I, I want to um, I want to wrap up with a couple questions for sure. you because you are a obviously you're you know you're a, a we'll call it a, a servant to continuing education and mm -hmm. mentorship, which and we we follow a very similar background, um, and 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 career evolution, if you will, and, and so you know, one of the things I love to discuss with people like you is just the role that mentorship has played in your life and kind of your belief system around, I don't know, what would you suggest for other people with respect to, I would say that everyone, I believe that everyone needs a coach in some capacity. Agreed. And so what I would love to hear from you is, is why do you think that is so relevant for anyone listening, whether they're listening just because this is the Smart Nutrition Made Simple show, they want to improve their life, their health, their fitness, you know, um, or maybe now they're really starting to think more ethereally outside the box around what they're capable of. How can a coach contribute to this? So one of the beauties, one of the biggest benefits of working with a coach or a mentor is they help the one, they help to shortcut the process for you. Like I said earlier, when I was like, yeah, I'm trying to tackle this nutrition thing by myself. I'm reading blogs and books and magazines right. and I'm like, I can't make any sense of it. Finding a mentor, like it shortcut the process for me so much. It probably took, it probably took 10 years off of that, that discovery process for me. So one, it helps shortcut the process. You go, don't go through all these mistakes. It helps you, a coach or a mentor will help you sort out the information that actually makes sense. And it's really important that you vet out your coach or your mentor. Spend some time researching. I tell people the same thing when you're finding a doctor or even a chiropractor or a dentist, like spend some time, even a personal trainer, like spend some time researching them, ask about previous results, see some of the, the body of work that they've done. So one, shortcut the process. Two, they help you find your own blind spots. You know why they're blind spots? Because they're blind spots. We can't recognize them ourselves. So having a guide along the way will basically, they'll hold up mirrors to us in a way that we haven't been able to see. And so we can actually address those things. Same thing. That's going to shortcut the process for you. Because if you continue down the same path you're on, maybe if you're trying to do like self-study on something and trying to tackle it all by yourself, you still have all these biases that are preventing you from actually moving forward in a meaningful direction. Mm -hmm. So a coach or a mentor is going to be able to help challenge you, but also help inspire you by addressing what these things are that are, that are not revealed to you at that moment in time. Because I have a tremendous amount of appreciation and respect for Dr. Kashi, as do you, I'm sure. And mm -hmm. um, I've learned so much, you know, from him. So what I would love to know is how did he help you start to think about things differently mm. in life and nutrition and, you know, whatever? Yeah. Great question. So initially it was developing the skills for tracking information on myself. I hadn't really done that properly. I tried to count protein in my head sure. until I actually started using a scale and measuring things in grams. Then I could actually make informed decisions. Right. If I'm looking at a box of, you know, a can of tuna and then a box of pasta and I'm trying to make those measurements and maybe like a cup of milk, it's just wildly inaccurate. Yeah. So whether it's data, as far as our health, our training, our nutrition, our sleep or something else, Collecting information, objective information is very helpful, but I think subjective is too. Hence why I recommend keeping a journal or some kind of diary to journey your life, to track your life. Then we can actually take this information in a meaningful way and make decisions based on that. So I'd say that was one of the biggest ones, developing my level of self-awareness in a way that actually makes sense, in a way that's proven. That's awesome. And I, I would say the exact same thing just from his teachings is is really putting all of that into perspective and, and it has played a you know significant role into how we run our business in terms of how we coach our clients, the, the value of objective measurements as, as, as being incredibly important, it's not the end all be all, right? But it's, it provides such a solid foundation to help us make informed decisions moving forward. Yes. I guess lastly is who are the other mentors that you've learned the most from in your career? So some, some are alive, some are dead. Uh, the alive ones, as I mentioned earlier, Jack Elias, he's a master 
hypnotherapist and NLP practitioner based out of Seattle. I highly recommend. I'll, I'll send you a link for him as well. If you want to show notes, he's amazing. Um, he was, he's been a major influence in my life. Uh, Moshe Feldenkrais. I don't know if you've read m- much of his yeah. material. Yeah, I, okay. A long time ago when I was yeah. studying through Czech Instant Institute. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. So Moshe Feldenkrais was a, he was a German physicist turned in the extremely intelligent human being. He died in the eighties, but he, he helped, I think he wor- helped work on the atom bomb or the hydrogen bomb, like in the forties, ended up injuring both his knees in soccer in the fifties. They told him he wouldn't be able to walk again if he got right. surgery. And he basically discovered this or created this process of movement mm-hmm. of movement through self-awareness that helps coordinate the body as a whole in different ways, because we all operate within like when you see your wife walking down the street and you don't see her face, you know, it's her, right? Like she has a certain pattern to her walk. We all carry ourselves in certain ways when we walk, when we're stressed, when we're, when we're feeling good, etc. cetera. Um, so anyways, long story short, Moshe Feldenkrais was massively influential for my understanding of the connection between the body and the brain. Yeah. And that changed everything for me as it relates to how I, how I look at human beings, both from a performance standpoint, but also from a compassionate and, and like psychological standpoint. Mm. A lot of people, he's not a real household name. Yeah. That's great, man. Yeah. That's great. Uh, Um, and then obviously Dr. Cashy, Dr. Cashy. Yeah. Incredible. Um, awesome dude. So is there anything else that you want to share just, you know, about your, your current business, your current coaching model, who it's for, who it's not for Uh, at this moment in time, I, I I just happen to work with a lot of like business owners or leaders or entrepreneurs and I'm. I'm honestly open to working with anybody, but I tend to work with a lot of these people. And what I really love about working with them is when they make changes in their lives, it has a ripple effect to their teams, their colleagues, their families, their employees, et cetera. And it's things I don't see, but I just really love the idea of if I can be a help to this person and then they make some changes in their lives and then it has that outward effect towards the people around them, then it's like mission complete, like the job well done. One of my guiding principles is one I've actually borrowed from, from Neil deGrasse Tyson. He's, and he says, mm-hmm. for me, I, I'm driven by two main philosophies in life. No more about the world than I did yesterday and to lessen the suffering of others. You'll be so surprised at how far that gets you. Mm-hmm. And that's just like, that's sat with me for years. And my, I, I'll say my calling is to lessen, is to help lessen the suffering of others in any way that I can, whether that's through empowerment, through strength, or whether it's having a conversation with somebody and helping them understand they're not who they think they are. Amazing. Well, I think that's been made abundantly clear just based on our conversation today and the value that you provided. Uh, so Tyler, I just want to say thank you very much for your time and for sharing all of that with our audience uh, and myself. Um, it's very enlightening for me as well and hopefully for, for, you know, for our audience. So with that said, brother, um, where can people find out more about you, your coaching program, so on. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having me, man. I really enjoy our conversations. Uh, you know, oh, again, super blessed that we had the chance to work out in the gym a couple weeks ago. Yeah. I'm looking forward to the next one. Me too. Um, you can find me on social media, uh, Instagram. I'm at, at Tyler James Wall, all one word. And then you can find me on my website, contrastbydesign.com. Beautiful. All yeah. right. You heard it there. You guys check him out. Follow him on Instagram. Smart, beautiful man. Appreciate you, Tyler. Uh, Appreciate we'll have you, to do this again and, and and certainly get our pump on soon. Well, maybe I'll just come up to New York. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Hang out because I haven't been to the city forever. And uh, it's vibing. if it's vibing, I got to be there, right? Like business. Yeah. <laughs> All right, brother. Take care. Keep up the good work. Cool. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Ben. Bye.